Okay, I think we are almost ready to go. Uh, welcome again to everybody and thank you very much for making yourself available to join today's session focused on the post-pandemic situation of China's outbound tourism. Today we are honored to have a very special welcome speech uh, from Maria Linares, who is the responsible of tourism at the Embassy of Spain uh, in China. Maria is not available today, but she has prepared a very special presentation uh, to be shared with you. Greetings from the Spanish Tourism Office in Beijing. First of all, I would like to thank the public company for the management of tourism of Andalusia and the Institute of Foreign Promotion of Castilla-La Mancha for organizing this seminar by Europe Chambers and for giving to Tour Spain the opportunity for this collaboration. Especially, I would like to remark the foresight you both have, planning and establishing horizons in the medium term that support the adaptability of our companies to the new needs of the Chinese market. Thanks for having this vision and perspective. From the Spanish tourism office in Beijing and Guangzhou, we keep working with enormous commitment and dedication. The two pillars of our strategy are on the one hand, to take care and listen actively to the sector in China and Spain, and on the other, to activate our image and our position, not only to remain present in the mind of Chinese tourists as before the pandemic, but with the goal of increasing our visibility and adapt to the new digital tools in this challenging market. Please allow me to make a brief, a brief introduction about this market, its situation and perspectives. Despite the fact that the Chinese market will foreseeably take some time to lift the quarantines that nowadays stop the tourists to come, the months ahead are key to invest in visibility and to improve the position of our companies. It is always useful to remember why this tourism market is crucial, the reason being the characteristic of Chinese tourists, avid consumers of culture who enjoy urban landscapes, shopping and gastronomic components. In the case for Spain, this type of tourism strongly contrasts with our most traditional sand and beach tourism. In addition, Chinese tourists are our biggest spenders per stay, with over 2.400 euros and trips as long as eight days, according to 19, 2019 data. Also, Boston Consulting Group said that four out of 10 high impact tourists in Spain, that is with high level of income and spending were Chinese, ahead of all the countries that traditionally provided this type of tourism. Regarding the current market situation, there are some indicators that allow us to be reasonably optimistic. As in Europe, the speed and at which China is vaccinated, vaccinating its, its population are positively hopeful. They have already supplied the two doses to 50% of this population and there are on their way to achieve group immunity by the end of the year. A fundamental milestone in all forecasts for the sector in China are the Winter Olympics, which will be held in Beijing at the beginning of February 2022. From a pandemic perspective, if the development of the Games is carried out successfully, we can foresee a gradual, gradual opening of Chinese tourism market to tourism through the spring. Several studies by the European Travel Commission and other analysts affirm that despite of the pandemic, Spain and other Western countries have kept their allure intact and the desire to travel is still present in the Chinese tourists. In fact, the latest barometer by the ETC precisely said that 53% of Chinese respondents were enthusiastic about traveling abroad. Other key elements that give room for optimism from the perspective of the sector are the enormous adaptability of the intermediate sector, the airline sector and the general tourism industry in China, which has reoriented towards domestic travel and e-commerce with success, but which will return to outbound tourism as soon as there is demand. And another good piece of information is the good health of the Chinese economy, the only major economy that grew by 2.3% in 2020 and in, with an IMF GDP growth forecast for 2021 of 8.1%. This obviously affects the existence of a contained demand. Finally, if I had to compact the suggestions for this market in only one, this would be the importance of visibility in the new Chinese internet. 
I am referring mainly to the inspiration of the future tourists and the improvement of the destination experience. Therefore, B2C visibility is key. And for this, the understanding of the evolution of the Chinese internet is essential. The internet has evolved independently and without parallel with the West. So that the equivalent of Google would be the WeChat platform as an integrated whole, not only as a chat. On this platform, which also has videos, social networks, and other services, many programs are hosted, where users seek information and inspiration for their trips inbound now. We have to know and understand the Chinese internet well to do the right promotion on this platform, but also on others, and enhance our presence in social networks and live streams with the help of new partners, such as Mafungwo, Qyir, Frigi, and others. The coming months offer the opportunity to make an effort to include our destinations and products in this digital frame that will allow us to position ourselves optimally in front of our competitors, giving our destinations the necessary visibility. Therefore, China continues to be an enormously dynamic country that is moving very intensely towards the digital consumer. Its tourism sector is resisting with few losses, and there is a huge accumulated demand, which will scale rapidly as soon as market access conditions improve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Maria Linares uh, for this um, uh, wonderful speech. And uh, before we leave the floor to today's speaker, and after thanking again uh, the Institution of uh, Promotion and Development uh, of Castilla-La Mancha, uh, Tour España, and the region of Andalusia, uh, please allow me first to share a small presentation of us, the USME Center, and what we can do uh, for your business. The USME Center is a EU Commission funded project that has been operating since 2010 with the goal of helping European SMEs uh, interested in operating in the Chinese market. We are currently on our third phase uh, running until March 2022. Hopefully we will be able to keep on providing services afterwards. Um, and uh, we mainly provide what we call first range of supporting services, which include uh, wide market information information, one-to-one -one consultation, training sessions like today, and other uh, supporting services. We are an official member of Enterprise Europe Network, which allows us to work with more partners in Europe and to reach to more SMEs. Um, in China, uh, we work with different government agencies in order to um, make our support a little bit wider and to uh, focus on specific areas of interest. We do have an office in Beijing, and we are implemented by the following uh, five business support organizations that you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, the implementing partners are uh, most of them based in, in China, as you could see, except at Euro Chambre, uh, which is the umbrella organization here in, in Europe. In terms of services, as I was mentioning before, we have four main blocks of services. Uh, the first one is called the Knowledge Center. I usually uh, call it online library because in this section you can find over 200 market reports, guidelines, case studies, and business articles on a very uh, wide variety of topics. Some of the um, market reports or the information you can find here is very transversal and it will apply to different sectors. For instance, those focused on uh, digital marketing, e-commerce, uh, WeChat, etc. And some others are more specific and focused into specific sectors. For instance, China outbound tourism, which is a market report you can also find on our website, uh, green technology, food and beverage, healthcare, etc. Uh, we keep on updating and publishing new reports. Uh, the best option for you is to stay tuned, to subscribe to our newsletter, or uh, to visit our website frequently to see what has been uploaded recently. The second service or the second block is called uh, the Advice Center. And here we have two main services. This is the first one. 
the self-diagnosis tool, a very uh, new service we have launched a few months ago, which allows uh, participants to go up the level of readiness towards the Chinese market. How is this done? Well, we present five different quizzes. The first one is a generic one, and then we have uh, four different uh, ones focused on business development, product, uh, founding, and HR, um, where uh, the system is going to ask questions to the participants in regards to the situation of the company, for instance, in regards to IP protection, business development, uh, partners dist uh, or distributors research, etc. But the most important thing is that at the end of the quiz, the system is telling you how far you're from ideal, and the system gives you advices on how to actually get better prepared, giving you reference to some market reports, connecting to some sister pro uh, projects, also targeting um, China, such as the China IP SME Help Desk, or uh, giving you additional tips to in order to help you to continue moving forward. The, fir the, the general quiz only takes uh, five minutes to be completed, uh, 10 minutes, sorry, and the other ones, it only takes five. So I really, uh, for those companies really looking into the market, I really encourage you to taste it. Um, the second service is uh, a service within the advice center. It's uh, what we call Ask the Expert. This is a hot desk service um, uh, we offer to all SMEs in Europe. Um, it is confidential and it is complimentary. And here you can submit any question regarding uh, business development, legal standards and conformity or HR. It usually takes our, uh, uh, our experts uh, two, three uh, working days to reply to your inquiries and you can submit as many questions as you want. The third block is the training center, and today is uh, one of the best examples uh, we can use. Uh, we try to plug the knowledge and skill gaps of SMEs that try to enter the Chinese market, or in this case, that try to attract uh, Chinese consumers. Um, we organize these events in cooperation with uh, business support organizations in Europe. As you could see today, we are working with uh, several, some of them. Uh, and here we try to hear our partners in Europe uh, to see which topics or which um, directions we should be focusing on. Um, this allows me or Perhaps this is a good moment to mention that at the end of the presentation, at the end of the of the training, uh, the system is going to refer you to an online survey where we are going to be ask, asking you um, your feedback about this event, but also asking you suggestions on which other topics you would like to learn about China. We, we extremely encourage you to do this uh, because it really helps us to, to create uh, content of your interest. And last but not least, we also provide, uh, we have an advocacy platform, thanks to uh, one of our implementing partners, the European Chamber of Commerce China, where we try to uh, give voice to the concerns and the requests of the European SMEs operating in China. Additionally, we uh, are part of the Interchamber SME Working Group, where actually we try to uh, keep everybody updated on any uh, changes or updates in the uh, regulatory economic and social environment in China. Now, a little bit of what we are going to do in the coming weeks and months. Uh, obviously, we are going to have a, a reduction of our activities uh, due to the summer break. But as you could see, we are already working towards autumn uh, in order to make a full and interesting agenda for you. Again, similar to my uh, previous advice, stay tuned to our calendar or social media to see what it's coming up, because this list will enlarge uh, soon. And uh, as you could notice, uh, the variety of topics is, is, uh, is it's quite uh, wide, so um, we hope to continue uh, expanding this as well. And uh, before just uh, giving the floor to Wolfgang, I would like to, to mention to you that we are uh, publishing a call for proposal where we are looking for companies that are operating in China uh, and have actually managed to continue doing business or started doing business in China uh, during, during the COVID. Uh, the idea is to invite those companies to a conference that will take place on the 14th of uh, October to share their experience and to give advices uh, to other SMEs on how they can and actually improve their business in China. One small technical reminder to make everything smooth. Um, 
uh, we are going to encourage you asking questions along the, the, the webinar. Do not wait until the end because you might risk that uh, Wolfgang will not have time to reply to your questions. Please do it along the way or as soon as it comes up to your mind. But please do use the Q&A uh, button that you can find at the, um, at the, at the lowest part. Uh, leave the chat panel only for um, exchanges between participants or exchanges with us or just some comments, nothing related to the Q&A so that we can actually make sure that your question is replied along the presentation. And uh, now, right now is the time for uh, Professor Dr. Wolfgang. Um, he's actually one of our longest experts uh, at the USME Center with over uh, 15 years of experience uh, with us. And um, uh, of course, his fields of expertise are uh, China outbound tourism. And uh, Professor Dr. Wolfgang has been a teacher uh, himself for quite a long time. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Laura, for the kind uh, introduction. And also uh, before, um, maybe she can't hear us, but still saying thank you to Maria uh, in uh, Beijing. I think this was a very good uh, start of our session. And uh, certainly I share the optimism about the future development of the Chinese tourism industry and what we will do in the next, uh, two hours or a bit more than two hours is to see what we can do on our end uh, to uh, prepare for this new wave of Chinese outbound tourists uh, we are uh, certainly uh, to, to expect. So how to optimize what we are doing for them. So, and uh, let me uh, start the presentation. So, Uh, whoops, here we are. So you should now uh, see the slides, I hope. And uh, so, yeah, the topic is obviously the post-pandemic situation of China's outbound tourism. Uh, we are all aware uh, of the fact that the post-pandemic has not yet arrived really, but this is the time to prepare for it. And well, uh, hopefully, as many people have been saying, there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I would say the light at the end of the tunnel is a Chinese lampion. So yes, yeah, so just very briefly about me. So I've, I've been uh, visiting China for uh, more than 40 years. Uh, and I used to be a tour operator myself in the 1990s. And for the last 20 years, I've been a university professor. And since, 2004, uh, I have been also the uh, founder and CEO of China Outbound Tourism Research Institute, Kotri. And well, I'm, I think uh, uh, as you are interested in this topic, I, we might have met in some conferences or you will have maybe read some of our stuff before. And uh, uh, I'm just to mention uh, the last one, uh, since a few months, I'm also the founding dean of the HATT Business School Institute, where we also offer a lot of trainings for the Chinese outbound market. Uh, so, yeah, and the Institute, of course, is uh, uh, a, there to help everybody outside of China uh, to make Chinese tourists happy and to earn some money in the process. And uh, we are members of uh, UNWTO affiliate member and of WTA in China. And uh, we are knowledge partners of the WTTC and member of ITOA and also of, of PATA. Okay, so what are we doing today? We will start uh, by looking at the current situation of China's outbound tourism, especially of course, looking at uh, what is uh, to be expected after the end of the pandemic and, and what will be the new uh, demands of Chinese outbound travelers. And so we will then look uh, what does it mean for uh, product adaptation, important topic we will talk about, the development of new uh, key performance indicators uh, and brand building and marketing uh, and how to use also something Maria has been mentioning in her introduction, uh, old and new 
communication and distribution channels. And after that, we will have uh, the first uh, uh, Q&A session. And as Laura, uh, our host today, uh, said already, so please uh, feel free to use the Q&A button and already post some questions and we will uh, try to answer them uh, the first round uh, there. And after that, we will uh, have uh, the third module, which is China Punk tourism uh, market in the coming years. So how to stay competitive in the market. And in this part, I have uh, used a couple of examples. So uh, to show what can be done. And as I'm aware that the majority of participants is uh, based in Spain. So, and, uh, and we had the pleasure also to do some research uh, with Tour España over the years and some other research as well for Spain. So I, I've used mostly examples from Spain. So, but we, for those from other countries, uh, I'm sure that this will also be interesting for you. And so that is also, I mean, because we not only have Spanish people, it's in English, but no, actually my Spanish is limited to strictly tourist Spanish. Like, uh, I don't know, I can say dos cervezas mas por favor. I think that's about <laughs> it. Okay, so, uh, where, where are we now? And so we can see, of course, uh, as we all are aware, outbound tourism from China has been growing uh, a lot in the last 15 years, A, because of the booming economy. And so the establishment of a Chinese upper middle class, so the top 10% of the society. And on the other hand, the government opening the doors uh, in the last 20 years to allow uh, Chinese to travel for leisure, but also for other activities. And so let me say right from the start, uh, don't forget that a lot of Chinese tourists are not traveling just for leisure, but there's also business, there's educational travel, there are other activities. And when we talk about why do we have to uh, do anything specific about Chinese visitors uh, to Europe, so the, the short answer to this is clearly that Chinese tourists, when they come to Europe, they're not coming for holidays. They're not coming for recreation. They're not coming for not staying at the beach and not doing anything other than enjoying the sunshine and uh, maybe a, a drink. This is not what Chinese people come to Europe. And this is the biggest thing we will have to learn if this is Spain or other destinations that these customers come uh, to Europe to do something, to have experiences, to have uh, activities. And so that is what uh, we, will, we will have been, we will look at. Uh, as been, uh, has been already mentioned, so the Chinese economy has recovered faster than all the other uh, major industry, uh, industrial countries in the world. So there's a lot of money in China waiting to be spent on international travel. And there is, as we all are happy that now we can start uh, to travel again in Europe. Also, the Chinese are eagerly waiting to be able to uh, travel again. So we will, uh, we will look today in the question, how can we do the restart of Chinese upland tourism in a better way, not just going back to normal, but actually going towards what we call meaningful tourism through the improvement of quality and with the support of recommendation marketing. We will talk more about uh, that soon. So uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai, uh, who has, was the Secretary General of UNWTO and is now the Secretary General of WTFI, World Tourism Forum Institute, which runs the HUD BSI, uh, so the business school, so which is now in some way my boss uh, has been saying many times, the point is not to return to the old normal, but to move forward to a new, better normal. Because the challenge we, we are facing, and this is not only for tourism from China, is clearly that uh, we need to, uh, a paradigm shift. And this need was there before the virus came. So we have been simply too, too successful. So 
we have uh, uh, in the last 40 years, the number of international trips increased five times, uh, but the uh, organization has not been growing with it. And so uh, you can see that in many places, it juggernaut has been running over local culture, uh, authenticity, diversity, serendipity. So meeting uh, something good uh, by chance. And this has negatively impacted the satisfaction level of all stakeholders involved. Uh, and we have seen uh, a few weeks ago, the first pictures of again, this gigantic cruise ships uh, in uh, the Guidecha Canal in, in, in Venice. Uh, so going back to the bad old times and we see all inclusive resorts, which are like a UFO not bringing any money to the local economy, uh, overcrowded beaches, disified tourist cities. Uh, so all of this we are aware of and, and we remember maybe now we have a nostalgia for oh the time before the pandemic, how wonderful it was. But if you really look back, you will remember the discussions about over tourism and uh, you will remember host communities uh, telling the tourists uh, go home, we, we don't want you here. Or uh, I remember I was at a conference in Mallorca uh, when I was told in 2019 that the locals had been uh, throwing horse shit, sorry, uh, for my French, uh, had been throwing horse shit to uh, uh, cruise ship passengers coming on onto the island uh, because they said, they, they, we don't want to have you here. So uh, we see that there is a, is a way we need to change global tourism and Chinese outbound tourism being an important part of that is uh, one of the parts where we need to change. Uh, we have about 10% of global tourism is and will again be at least Chinese outbound tourism. So without this customer group, uh, there will be no way to have a more sustainable tourism development. So let us start uh, to look what is the current uh, situation. So uh, I don't want to go back too much in history, but just to remind you for the Chinese, this is still something relatively recent. So only from 1997, the Chinese government officially accepted that there is something like international, uh, especially leisure tourism. And it was only 2016, a uh, couple of years ago, that more than half of the border crossing from mainland China did not just end in Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, uh, but went actually beyond that. Uh, so that really uh, the, the fact that China is the biggest outbound tourism source market uh, is really only true or has been true for the la last few years of the last decade. But by 2019, certainly China's outbound tourism was in terms of number of trips and also in, in spending uh, more than the size of USA and Germany combined. And of course, we also saw uh, before the pandemic that many countries offered uh, for Chinese citizens either visa-free entry or at least e-visa or visa on, on arrival. And unfortunately, uh, Schengen area has been lacking behind and uh, was basically the only exception of the major destination areas where Chinese still had to apply for a visa each and every time they were entering. So in Europe, there are only a few countries like Serbia and Albania uh, where Chinese people could and still can enter without a visa. So the uh, success story in, in, in numbers, and you can see uh, the dark part, this is a great visit to greater China and the yellow part is a visit to the rest of the world. So this has been growing uh, with a fantastic speed from like 10 million in, at the beginning of the new millennium to uh, 170 million in 2019. And uh, yeah, of course, we all know the story of last year and the forecast for this year, assuming that in October, uh, the first Chinese travelers will start to travel again. We will talk about this a bit later. But as there's so much pent up demand, so we are quite optimistic that by 2022, if no new mutations or whatever happens, uh, we will go back to where we were before in terms of, of numbers. 
So how important is Europe uh, for the Chinese outbound market? And well, it's no surprise that uh, the region, the neighboring uh, destinations have been the top uh, the preferred destinations. And we can see that, so among the top seven, uh, there has never been a European country and uh, some of the, the big ones like Italy, France, Germany, Russia have been uh, some years among the top 15, but also not consistently. So Europe is uh, after the USA outside of Asia, the, the ma major destination, but we have to keep in mind that for our colleagues from the Chinese tourism industry, uh, travel to Asia have been much more important in, in, in the, at least a number of visitors in the past. So uh, looking at the 2018 numbers here, we can see that uh, about 15% of those who went beyond Hong Kong and Macau uh, went to, to Europe, but we can also see that there is a clear uh, difference be between uh, travels to, to uh, Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which still had each had about 6 million arrivals and much smaller numbers for Northern and Southern Europe. So that, that was clearly still the case that, uh, especially for first time visitors, they would go to uh, mostly to Western Europe. We, the need to do something is not only shown in the problems of over tourism, but also simply in the fact, if you look at the numbers that the market share of Europe has been going down. So we had growth in our arrival numbers, but uh, not in the same speed as the overall development of the Chinese outbound market. And especially if we look at the long haul, so beyond greater China, uh, we have been uh, losing out. And so our growth has been uh, not uh, as fast and especially uh, so uh, uh, Western and Central Eastern Europe, you can see have been going down from something like 18% to something like 13, 13%. So we need to do something. Uh, and we that was a problem even before the pandemic uh, struck. So, and what happened and will continue to happen even more so is that we can see the sophistication of the Chinese travelers has been increasing. So they were able to, to know and to tell what, what they want and to compare. So I, I told you I was a tour operator in the 1990s and at that time, almost all our customers were first time in their life outside of China. They had no idea uh, they were happy with all the services we gave them. Of course, we tried to give them the best possible services, but they, they had no way to compare if the hotel uh, we were giving them uh, was uh, very good or average or, or, or below average because they had never been outside China in, in any kind of hotel. Uh, they knew maybe Hilton uh, as a brand, but that was about it. Uh, so nowadays, uh, the experienced travelers, they will, they will discuss among themselves, yeah, the, the hotel in, in Madrid was nice, but the hotel in, uh, in Dubai was of course for the same, uh, much nicer for the same money or the, the hotel in, 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 in uh, Las Vegas compared to the hotel in, in Copenhagen. So they, and, and they can tell you, oh, I rather want to have a five-star hotel. I rather want to have a boutique hotel. I rather want to have a typical local place. So because they have made the, uh, uh, the experiences, they tried out different things. Also, of course, more and more people as I say, I want to do something special in my, in my trip. I have a hobby, I have a pastime and I want to do that. And that can be from wine tasting to playing golf to uh, looking at uh, some kind of architecture and so on. Also what we have, what we are cle clearly saying is that the age groups are diversifying. So we have more young people traveling and also we have more older. So this is 55 plus for China uh, people traveling. So we don't have only this middle aged people which were uh, making the majority uh, before. And uh, of course the, the Chinese open travelers have much more information 
available than than before. And during the pandemic, certainly uh, all the major uh, national tourism organizations and marketing organizations have been uh, keeping on uh, promoting uh, the destinations and pro uh, sending videos. And the Chinese had more time because they couldn't travel to look at this stuff. So you can be sure that the Chinese customers, when they come to your destination, they read a lot of comments from other Chinese travelers, mostly uh, Mafang Wo and QYR were mentioned by Maria in the introduction already. Uh, and they will have a very detailed uh, knowledge. So you can find discussions on social media, uh, which is the best uh, restaurant in uh, Rome to 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 eat uh, some special uh, uh, Italian dish. Uh, so uh, and and so people are really have a high level of of knowledge if they're interested. And also a very important part what we have been seeing and we will see even more now after the restart is that language is not such a problem anymore because you have all more people speak English than before uh, because for each year another age cohort comes so, uh, with uh, English classes in school. But also there you have all these technical gadgets either special machines or apps for the, for the smartphone where you can speak into the machine in Chinese and it will speak in whatever Spanish, Finnish, uh, Hungarian, whatever language you want. So language barrier is, is not the problem anymore. If anything, then it is that the Chinese uh, tourists are complaining that in many destinations, uh, the, the service providers don't speak English. So that the Chinese say, yeah, there's a language problem because uh, we, we speak English, but the local uh, guys in the hotel or wherever don't don't speak English. So, uh, but so this was the stuff which was happening before. But uh, what we could see that the the market share has been decreasing as as we as we saw, and also we saw that there was a concentration on quantitative KPIs, arrival numbers. Uh, but as many of you will will know that uh, that resulted in that you had a lot of customers, but you had a, a low yield. You didn't earn much per person. And also uh, from the service, you could see that from the Chinese side, there was rather low levels of satisfaction. They were saying it was okay, but not spectacular. We are, we are happy it was good, but it wasn't, we didn't feel that we were especially welcome that people were really caring, especially for us as Chinese travelers. And of course, also for the hosts. Uh, often people were annoyed if you have large groups of people traveling around, not really constant, uh, interested in what, what they are saying. So, and as we will talk about uh, more uh, a little bit later, so the Chinese market is, offers a good opportunity to bring people to other parts of your destination at other parts of the year because they, they're not coming for the typical holiday places. They're not coming for, the, for, for beaches. Uh, so if you give them a good reason, they will come also uh, at other times of the year. Half of the Chinese living in the southern part are not sun seekers. They don't care about sunshine. They have sunshine at home enough. Uh, and, and also uh, they don't have these fixed ideas where, where to go to. Uh, but uh, as no uh, special offers in most cases have been there. So you could see that the Chinese uh, were also going to the same places at the same time of the year than the majority of the other tourists. And so thereby not uh, helping to mitigate uh, over tourism and, and seasonality, but actually uh, making it even a bigger problem. And I, I, I as I said, I will use uh, examples mostly from from Spain uh, so and we can see that Spain is a good example it has Spain has been very successful in getting more Chinese visitors you can see on the right hand side it moved from something like uh, 250,000 five years ago to 700,000 in 2019 so Spain started rather late but was very successful in telling people this is a nice uh, place to visit, especially for Chinese tourists coming for the second time 
uh, to Europe and where maybe the first time they were going to France and to Germany and to Switzerland. So second time they would go to the Iberian uh, Peninsula. But if you look at the graph uh, at the bottom on the right hand side, you can see that at the beginning, the Chinese were not following the typical <coughs> uh, seasonality pattern. They, they, were, they were coming uh, rather evenly distributed, which uh, was good news. But as nobody offered them special reasons to come and everybody told them, yeah, we are a summer destination, uh, they start to, started to believe it and the Chinese tour operators started to believe it. And if you see uh, the development year by year, the seasonality pattern became more and more similar to the pattern uh, of the uh, other traditional Northern European markets. So this was the chance to paint on an empty canvas uh, was unfortunately wasted. So a uh, quick look, uh, who is traveling? I'm sure you have been seeing uh, some, some information about this in, uh, before. Just to give you uh, again, a clear idea. When we talk about the Chinese outbound travelers, we talk about the top 10% of the population, which is uh, often called middle class, but actually it is of course the upper class or the upper middle class, if you want to be polite. Uh, and we see that basically, so at the bottom, we have about 150 million people, which is the number of people having a passport. It's also about the number of people owning a private car in China. So where you have a, uh, an income level, which is about uh, starting from $10,000 uh, a, a year, that is not a month, that's a year, and going, of course, up to uh, very high numbers. So, and obviously from $10,000, uh, income a year, you cannot travel internationally, but uh, many of the Chinese who are our customers, our guests are earning money, not from their income from their job, but mostly uh, the big amounts come from real estate business. So uh, if you're able to buy and sell apartments, uh, you can make a lot of money uh, out of that. And also maybe you have somebody giving you some good tips for the stock market. Uh, this is where the money comes from. Otherwise, many people are saying, well, how can they afford traveling so much if they if they have only an income of uh, like a uh, $1,000 uh, a, a month? And we can see going a, a step down. So the people where it's already becomes more interesting, uh, the level of income, that's about 70 million, half of these people, about 5% of the population. And actually that is the majority of people who are uh, really uh, traveling long haul and coming to us in Europe. So, uh, and we can say that the people living in the first tier cities, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, these were the pioneers and these are still the majority of, of travelers coming to Europe, but the second and even the lower tier uh, city people are catching up. Uh, but uh, most of them still are traveling mostly to, to, to Asia. Uh, and so if you have those more sophistic sophisticated travelers, uh, there is certainly a 70% chance that they come from one of the four biggest cities. And what we can see and what is certainly a trend which will continue uh, and much more uh, post pandemic is that this typical package tour groups, uh, 45 people in a bus, jumping out of the bus, taking a photo, eating Chinese food and going the next day to the next city. This is getting less and less and we see more and more people uh, self-organized travel or traveling in small groups uh, with the help of a tour operator, but where they tell the tour operator what they want to do uh, and uh, not that uh, they are the uh, hostages of the, of the tour guides. So, so we see that uh, most of the experienced travelers want to go to new places and this from all the surveys after what people say what they will do after they can travel again, that they want to go to, to local places, to smaller places, people with uh, less crowds and uh, are more interested than ever before in authentic experiences, local cuisine, uh, nature, 
experiences and meeting people, which again relates to the fact that they have, the, the language problems are not so important anymore. So uh, you can see in this graph so that probably we will have a uh, splitting of the market in about three parts of similar size. So one, still the group tours, still people traveling for the first time and maybe living in a third tier city, so not so confident to travel by themselves. And then what is called customized travel. So smaller groups using a tour operator, uh, but saying, okay, we are interested in uh, horse riding or in uh, uh, architecture. And we, so you, we want you to help us to organize a trip according to our interests. Uh, and then about one third of FITs people who organize everything more or less by themselves. So, and as we said, uh, you can see that the uh, young people get less. <laughs> so after 30 years of uh, one child policy, so uh, we will uh, have uh, less young people. And, uh, but the good news is that we have much more affluent elderly people and elderly again is already starting at 55. Uh, that is the pension age for women in, in China. So, and we see also a lot of people saying now in the surveys that they rediscovered the value of family solidarity during the uh, bad months in China uh, with the pan pandemic, so that there is a much higher interest in traveling together as a family. So, uh, and just to give you some numbers, so, uh, according to the latest census, which was very recently published. So we have about 90% of the population, which is age 60 and above. And if you uh, add the, the 55 plus ladies to that, so it's about a quarter of the population in China, uh, which uh, is called the silver hair or the silver travelers in, in, in China. So, uh, and this is, as you can see in this graph, uh, only growing. So uh, as we have less young people, so the, the, the percentage of 65 plus is clearly uh, developing quickly. And of course, not all these people have enough money to travel, but you have the first cohorts of uh, internationally experienced, uh, mainly, maybe English speaking, tech savvy uh, people who are uh, so if they are now 65, that, that means they were born in the 1960s. So they, they had they started their own companies in the 80s or 90s and have been working in international markets for all their life. So they are not uh, peasants. Uh, they, they know the world and they will be interested. So uh, just one point to, to, to make, uh, and yeah, I, I have to look at, at the time as well. Uh, so I think it should be clear that the Chinese traveler doesn't exist. And this is whenever somebody tells you the Chinese want that, don't listen. So there, the, there are a lot of Chinese people and uh, obviously they are all different. So, and uh, just to take one example that I'm still asked many times. So are some, I, I know that Everybody knows Chinese people, when they travel, they only want to eat Chinese food. But now some people tell me, no, they want to eat local food. So which one is true, one or the other? And the answer is, of course, depends. Who are you talking about? So there are people traveling maybe the first time outside of China, and they are a bit reluctant that they don't want to eat too much foreign food because they don't know if their stomach can, can take it. But at the same time, the, you should not forget that there is some Starbucks and McDonald's and KFCs all over China, also down to fourth, fifth layer cities. So this is already Chinese food. So uh, even uh, some 55-year-old uh, uh, grandma from, from Ningxia province, from the countryside, will, have, uh, will be familiar with, with hamburgers. Uh, that is not uh, foreign food anymore at all. But more importantly, so you have a lot of experienced travelers who are saying now, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a foodie. So I am, I am, 
uh, somebody interested in food. And certainly I want to, to eat local food. I want to drink local wine or craft beer, big topic. And uh, I, so I want to spend more money also on fine dining. Uh, and this again, older tourists will be say, uh, more willing to say, okay, I, I want to go to a star rated restaurant and spend some money uh, on, on, on this. So, uh, and I will show you some examples later on. So if you storify this, if you put people in costumes, if you have so nice uh, information going with the food. So local food is now for most Chinese customers what, what, what they want uh, to have. If they can choose uh, for breakfast between a Chinese breakfast and the European breakfast, they will be happy, but it's clearly moving into this direction. But again, it depends on what kind of customers you have. So what not surprisingly, the first step is to know your customers much better maybe than this has been in in the past. And just to mention one uh, element uh, which is often overlooked is uh, the Chinese who are already here. So if you look at the statistics at the moment, you, you may be surprised that you find there are about 8,000, 10,000 Chinese people entering Germany, for instance, every month now. How can that be? And this is clearly, these are uh, Chinese already living within Schengen and uh, they can travel within Schengen. Uh, so these, these are students, there are uh, several hundred thousand Chinese students in Europe and you have a lot of expats, so you have a lot of Chinese companies. So I'm based in Hamburg. Uh, we have more than 500 Chinese companies because of the harbor, uh, lots of import export companies, banks, shipping companies. So all these have Chinese uh, employees and they are traveling also a lot. And so this might be, if you are not uh, in the game already, so if, if, it's, if Chinese customers are new for you, so maybe it's a good idea to start to attract Chinese who are already in Europe. So you don't have to uh, convince them that they come all the way from China, but maybe they just come just from a neighboring country or even a neighboring city. So uh, what has uh, been accelerated by the pandemic have, I think all these developments have been uh, put on fast forward as people had a lot of time to uh, get information and to talk to each other online and offline about travel experiences. And so you can see that uh, a lot of Chinese are saying, I want to have more exclusivity and that can mean uh, luxury hotels or it can also mean uh, self-drive. Uh, and I, I want to spend my time to do something exciting and uh, interesting uh, and I want to do more in the nature because it is maybe safer and also uh, so hiking and uh, hot air ballooning uh, stuff like that uh, is now very popular. Many people say that's what we uh, want uh, to do. So and and th and from the service also I think it's quite clear that the people who will be the first to travel internationally again beside uh, business travelers will be uh, high net worth individuals, so very rich people and students and younger Chinese, so which also tend to be the more adventurous ones. So a lot of Chinese people will travel not for, for leisure, but also for, for family uh, reasons. So the parents of a Chinese student who got a baby uh, but could not go back to China for a long time. They, they will come to see uh, their grandchild and, and all, all kind of business stuff, of course, going on. And some good news for us is that uh, it was a common wisdom until recently that, of course, the Chinese will first start to travel in the region before going uh, further afield. But at least with the current uh, situation of the virus, it looks like uh, we in Europe will have uh, a more stable situation sooner than many of the neighboring countries. If you look at the numbers for Indonesia or for Mongolia, for South Korea, unfortunately, uh, they, they are peaking. So that it might well be that uh, if the, the virus situation remains the way it is now, that we in Europe will really have a bigger share of Chinese travelers than maybe uh, places like Indonesia, Bali, because 
uh, trying to see it is either impossible to go there anyway, or they see this as too dangerous. So what has to happen for the, for the reopening of the, of the market? Uh, obviously three things. First, they need the permission to leave China and uh, well, we have to also have to let them in, uh, of course. But the key point is a quarantine. Now, if you go back to China after you have been outside of China, you have to go back into quarantine for two weeks, in some places, even three or even four weeks. So in many places, like if you fly into Shanghai as a Chinese person, you have to stay two weeks in a hotel in Shanghai. And then if you uh, travel on to your home city, then in your home city, you have to go again one or two weeks into, into quarantine. So this is not acceptable, of course, uh, for almost everybody. Second, you need uh, affordable air connections, but uh, I've been talking to a number of airline people and they all said, if the uh, opening happens, there will be very quickly, uh, the, the, the air connections will be reestablished, especially from the Chinese airlines, which obviously uh, are seeing a good chance to grab some market share because their uh, coffers are much fuller with money than those of the European airlines. Because in China, domestic uh, air travel is back to normal or even above the 2019 level already. And of course, most important part, trust, so that the Chinese uh, see that safety and hygiene in the destination is good enough that they, that they dare uh, to come. And uh, even though the Chinese government obviously is, is not facing elections in the same way we have in, in Europe, uh, still there has been what you can call a contra social and a agreement between the government and the upper strata of the Chinese society that uh, so nobody uh, is uh, uh, putting into question the rule of the Communist Party. And if you have seen the cele celebrations for the 100th anniversary, <laughs> certainly nobody is, is uh, supposed to ask this question. Uh, but the trade-in has been that, uh, so the uh, if you are somebody with some money in China, some education, you can start your own company, you can have your own car, and you have the freedom to travel. So, uh, and therefore also the Chinese government cannot only listen to the medical stuff uh, uh, and the health people saying, oh, we should keep the borders closed for a long time. They also have to listen to, listen to the people who say, for the social harmony, for the stability of the country, we need to uh, let people travel again. So, and therefore, uh, there are wide variations of what people think when China will open up again, uh, it might be for October 1st, Golden Week. Uh, some people say, no, it will only be for Chinese New Year. Some people say, no, it will only be after the Winter Olympics. Uh, so, uh, but of course, this is uh, very opaque and, and very hard to know. And maybe it, it is also not a yes, no decision, but that you will have some bubbles. And that, uh, so if, if, if we are lucky, maybe that the Chinese are allowed to travel to, to Europe before they are allowed to travel to uh, neighboring countries uh, because of the, of the uh, virus situation. So this is a, a short overview about what is the situation. And I think uh, I had prepared a video, but if I look at the time, maybe I'm, I'm not uh, showing this. Uh, I think this is recorded and maybe we will add the video uh, to the recorded version so you can see this later on. So uh, as, as, as we said, uh, so if you have any uh, questions, any comments, uh, please put them into the Q&A uh, section. And uh, after this second module, we will, we will move into now, uh, there will be the first Q&A session. And after the third module, there will be another one. So uh, this will not be forgotten, but uh, let's move on to say, uh, according to what I tried to show in the first module, what is the situation, what is the likely development? How can we uh, re react to that? 
how do we need to react to this, especially if we say we don't want to fall into the trap uh, of the development of, uh, before the pandemic uh, with high number of, of customers, but low yield and low satisfaction levels. So uh, we are in, in the hospitality business and we are a people business, many people are saying. And, and the word hospitality comes from hospice, uh, which means friendliness to, to strangers. In Chinese, uh, hauke means treating the guest well. And uh, in my language, uh, German, Gastfreundschaft uh, means friendship with guests. So all this is uh, clearly a very strong statement how uh, you're supposed to uh, welcome and, and be even friends with people coming from afar. And this is actually, uh, if you can see on, on the screen, uh, the Chinese characters be behind me. Uh, this is a quote from Confucius, uh, the first paragraph of the first uh, chapter of the most important books of Confucius. And this says, what a joy it is to welcome friends from afar. So this idea of hospitality is also a very important uh, concept for, for the Chinese society and the Chinese culture. So, but what is it what you have to do to make people feel welcome? And unfortunately, this simple golden rule, uh, do to others what you want them to do to, to you is not working across cultural borders. So you cannot just say because Th that's what I like, that's what I, I give to them, and then they will like it as well. Uh, and uh, what I don't like, I don't give to them. So I personally hate karaoke, uh, I have to say, but uh, lots of, especially Southern Chinese uh, tourists, they love karaoke, so uh, give them a karaoke room, and well, you can actually charge some uh, fee for that so you can earn some money and let them have the karaoke. It's not a question if you like it or not. So uh, in our trainings, we have one uh, mantra, which is uh, the, the warm has, be, has to be tasty to the fish, not the fisherman. So you don't like worms, but the fish don't like hamburgers. Uh, if you want to catch the fish, you better put a worm on your hook. So uh, of course, there is there is uh, there are limits for the adaptation of, of services. So, if the law forbids to open shops on Sundays in your country, there's nothing uh, you can do about it. And and of course, uh, if there are traffic jams, uh, even the best coach driver cannot do anything uh, about it. Uh, but uh, so still, of course, sometimes you can you can uh, have some uh development anyway so for china this is very important because the chinese culture is quite far removed from uh what we have in in uh europe saying that of course again there is a big difference if you have a chinese who has been a student in in, in harvard uh and somebody who comes out of china maybe the first time uh but uh certainly what you need to know is uh uh, who who are your customers and and uh, what is the culture uh, background which is important for Chinese uh, more than than for us and what are the practical limitations and very simple uh, Chinese don't have much holidays they work a lot and they are most all of, almost all of them are first generation rich so they don't uh, inherited, uh, they did not inherit their, their, their money, but they have, they are still working for it and working hard, uh, for this. So in Chinese, we have the saying of, uh, uh, 996, uh, so you work from nine in the morning to nine in the evening, six days a week. That is a typical, uh, office work hours. So, uh, they, they have not so much time. So they want to use their time, uh, for, for traveling very well so compared to a german uh six weeks uh paid holidays a year that is also some practical big difference so therefore when we talk about what to do and how to prepare for the chinese market we talk first of all about product adaptation and product development so based on understanding okay 
what do the different segments of the market want what are their needs what are their preferences so for which segments of the market can we offer good services and then uh, adapt the products to what the Chinese want. And this is, uh, in many cases, uh, making things shorter. So uh, saying, okay, what we, we do for half a day for our Northern European customers in Spain, we do in, 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 in half an hour uh, for the Chinese. So maybe it's, it's not so deep, but uh, they want, will want to do a lot of different things. And uh, also, for instance, for Chinese up on tourism, it's a lot about bragging. It's a lot about showing to your friends that you are somebody special, you do something special. So uh, it's, it's uh, important always to help Chinese people with the documentation. So give them nice photo spots, but also give them maybe uh, some uh, certificate or some proof that they have been uh, doing something, learning something visiting something. So that will be much more important than it will be, for instance, for, uh, I don't know, British or Swiss or German customers. So uh, another important thing, if you deal with families, clearly Chinese children are not supposed to play, they're supposed to learn. So whenever you do something for families with kids, or one kid in most cases, uh, stress the educational uh, level of what the, you are doing. So it, it's also fun, yes, but it's also the kid learned something which can be useful for the career in school and in university later on. So these are just some examples uh, of uh, the, the changes and of the uh, things you have to be aware of uh, if you want to have higher uh, satisfaction of the customers. Uh, which normally also means that they stay longer, spend more, and <clears throat> very importantly, recommend uh, your service or your destination to their friends and their virtual friends so that they also will help you with the promotion. Sorry. So uh, what we see is that uh, it was nice to have... Uh, quantitative uh, KPIs, but uh, we have to move onwards also to have qualitative KPIs where we, where we not only measure the number of arrivals and the number of overnights and the turnover, uh, but also uh, the uh, question of how, how happy are our customers and how much money are we actually earning from what, what we are doing. So these KPIs, of course, have to be the usual smart uh, criteria so don't do something like we want to be more or something but be specific make it measurable make it attainable of course uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't help to say uh, we want to double the number or we want to double the satisfaction level by, by uh, one, in one year that uh, it has to be relevant and of course you have to give it still the time what you want to achieve in, in what periods of time. Uh, so uh, uh, so yeah, I think we, so concentrating on qualitative KPIs is so that uh, one and, and how, uh, is sustainability. Of course, uh, the question is that if you get Chinese tourists to feel welcome to feel part of the uh, destination. So be a, so Gastfreundschaft being a friend, they are less likely to uh, spoil the environment and, and be careless uh, with, with what they're doing. So uh, thereby uh, minimizing the uh, environmental impact. Uh, so measure sentiment. So on the right hand side, you can see a, a good example from uh, our partners uh, from the TCI company. Uh, so that uh, you can you can measure what is the sentiment uh, from the social media uh, posts and, and other uh, tools in, in China. So uh, if, if there is, uh, so, and you can see for this, in this example, for instance, that 
uh, for most destinations directly after the COVID-19 crisis started. Uh, it, it went, uh, uh, that was put at zero, but so that the sentiment has been uh, recovering in, 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 in a big way, but in, in different ways, depending on uh, what um, happened in, in, and what was uh, also covered in, in the media uh, about the development in, in these countries. And uh, measuring satisfaction uh, by uh, having uh, all different kinds of uh, questionnaires or, or exit interviews. Uh, and you can, of course, uh, support this with some lucky draw or some uh, loyalty program or whatever. So to, to get Chinese uh, customers to uh, tell not only their friends, so what, which will be the measurement of the sentiment, but also tell to you directly uh, how happy they are or what else, what they were missing and what uh, was not uh, the way they, they, they liked it so that you can also learn and improve uh, the, the product. For uh, DMOs and for NTOs, and I think uh, a lot of uh, you uh, participating today are uh, working in this field, uh, it has been proven in, in, in several cases already that it's a very good idea uh, to do this together. So uh, it is not very easy, especially for a, a region or a smaller destination to uh, go, go it alone. Uh, so then you will spend all your efforts just to tell people that you are existing. Uh, so, and it is uh, of course, uh, especially now with the tourism industry uh, having had a very bad time and having, having had no income for a long time, uh, where government support is needed, uh, even more so that you are uh, having a pr public-private partnership task force or working group or whatever, where those people who are interested in developing the Chinese market, obviously people like you, following this uh, workshop today uh, are bring, coming together uh, and uh, have also the, the government side uh, in one way or another uh, included to jointly uh, do trainings, develop new products, develop new stories, coming to an agreement, okay, are we concentrating rather on uh, nature lovers? Are we concentrating on adventure uh, seeking tourists? Are we concentrating on families? Are we concentrating on older travelers? So what is, a, what is the best fit between uh, the, the demands of the different market segments and what we can offer? And then not try to sell every, everything to everybody, but to, to have an agreement, okay, we will, we will tell them we are especially good for this and especially good for that. Uh, and they're therefore uh, having a much bigger impact and a much clearer focus on what you want to achieve. So uh, even if you only talk about 10% of the Chinese population, we talk about 150 million people. This is, uh, uh, I don't know, Spain and France and, and Germany combined. And and uh, we also, uh, we talk about a, a huge country and the, the people in Beijing or in, and people in Guangzhou are very different uh, people uh, so that uh, it's a good idea to use this private public partnership to to concentrate on and come to an agreement on what uh, we are best in in offering depends on what kind of uh, destination uh, you are so uh, some countries have the problem that they are simply very small and so that uh, if you are Lithuania or if you are Slovakia, uh, you have to spend all your business, all your budget on telling people that you are existing. So which also means that maybe this private public partnerships for smaller countries uh, may not even be just for one region or even one country, but maybe for a bigger uh, region. So uh, that, uh, Lithuania probably uh, is a good idea for the Baltic countries to to go go together and uh, 
uh, do their their market marketing and their activities for the Chinese market, and also they're learning how to offer services together. Other countries are, of, of course, uh, luckier. So, for instance, uh, Portugal uh, is, of course, known because of the history and because of Macau or Austria is a rather small country, but uh, you have the Austrian-Hungarian Empire uh, and uh, you have Vienna as a capital for classical music. So they have, uh, compared to their size, they have less problem in being well known in in China. Uh, and so uh, the brand building is, of course, an important part. And and again, you will you you will have to to look uh, for the Chinese market what brand you are building, which might be different from the the, the brand you have for for other markets. So uh, <clears throat> if you are the I don't know the uh, Spain uh, coastal area in Spain, you will of course tell your your German and your British customers, yeah, come here. This is a place where you can relax and you can have fun. And uh, so this is a holiday place, a party place. Uh, but for 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 Chinese visitors, you will have to tell them a, another story and develop another uh, image, which doesn't hurt because uh, your European customers will never know what is the image you uh, you, you built for the for the Chinese customers. So. Important question, of course, is marketing. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, destinations, companies come to us and they say, help me with the marketing in China. And uh, normally our answer is always, well, wait a minute first, let's have a look at your product. And it turns out that in most cases, uh, there is what is to be done is rather product adaptation than uh, marketing and especially when it comes to uh, the famous uh, Chinese social media. So we can see that uh, a lot of money has been spent on WeChat accounts and, and Weibo accounts. And uh, I'm, maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, there's a company uh, uh, we also work together with Dragon Trail and they every week they publish uh, the rankings for NTOs and for DMOs and for hotel groups and for airlines. So uh, how many posts they had and uh, how many people have been actually looking at it or how many people are following it. And as you can see from this example from, from May uh, that uh, so for all these posts, uh, if you're lucky, 10,000 people are looking at this. But uh, if, if, if you're uh, taking, uh, for instance, number 13, German National Tourism Board, so uh, they had they had three posts, and this sometimes is very nicely done uh, videos in Chinese language. So a lot of lot of uh, money and 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 effort in, uh, went into it. And you have uh, the average views is fifteen hundred people, which for China is absolutely nothing. So you have Chinese celebrities easily having uh, twenty million or more people viewing uh, some of their their posts. So. So this is uh, simply a waste of money. So and uh, so there are a lot of destinations are saying, oh, we have an, our own WeChat account. And if you ask them, okay, how many people are actively following them? The numbers are quite small and it is mostly uh, preaching uh, to those who already are convinced. So obviously if you have a Chinese student in Edinburgh and when they go back to China, they will follow what Edinburgh is, is uh, saying, but that doesn't make it more or less likely for them to come back uh, to, to, to visit the place. So, uh, of course, it's not a black and white thing. It's not that you don't uh, have to use them at all, but uh, there is a lot of concentration on, on this uh, promotion when uh, it is actually uh, only a small part of, of what, you, what you actually uh, have to do so and uh, if you look at customer acquisition costs and so on I, I won't go into details here uh, you can see that this is all rather uh, if you look at it uh, rather desperate uh, numbers and and you can see uh, 
that in, in Weibo, uh, it's very easy to get followers and you can see that uh, most of the, the major companies uh, and major NTOs here, they have uh, hundreds of thousands of followers, maybe more than a million followers. But uh, if you look, for instance, at the bottom, uh, visit Finland, they, they have 700,000 followers, uh, but they got uh, only a 0.02% of them engaging uh, with, the, with, with the content. And these are the top 20. So below this, there are still uh, uh, in a couple of uh, 30, 40 more. Uh, oh, yeah, so 44 more, 64 altogether, uh, where the results are even worse. So uh, this cannot be the answer to the question, how do I attract more Chinese customers and maybe even uh, upper end market customers. And uh, Maria uh, from to España, Beijing office in her introduction already mentioned Mafang Wo and QYR, so travel portals where the travelers themselves discuss among themselves what is uh, the good and the bad things of a destination. And this is uh, user generated content, uh, which is much more uh, seen for the, by the Chinese as trustworthy. And because if you are the uh, <coughs> Andalusia uh, region, uh, and I've been there many times. It's one of my favorite places. I know it's a wonderful place, but if you are Andalusia tourism board and you tell people uh, Andalusia is wonderful in, in China, why as a Chinese uh, potential visitor, why should I believe you? I mean, I know you're paid for saying Andalusia is wonderful. That's your job. And yeah, it is, it, it, it's true, but how can I know that? So I will ask my peers, I will ask other people, I will read what people have been writing on places, importance uh, like Mafang War, uh, what they can tell me about Sevilla and and, and Jerez and, and uh, uh, all this uh, Granada. And that will be important for me much more from all this official stuff. So probably most of you have at some point in, in your earlier uh, years uh, heard about the four P of marketing of Kotla. Uh, and these are product price place promotion. But if we look at what is happening when we talk about the Chinese outward market, uh, almost everybody is concentrating on only one of the four P's, which is promotion. So, but marketing is more than promotion. Marketing is also product and also price and also place. And if you only, uh, if the product is more or less the same everywhere, and not something the Chinese find exceptionally good. Uh, the tour operators come and say, let's concentrate on price uh, and, and push the, the prices down. So uh, remember, marketing is not the same as promotion. Promotion is only one part of the marketing. And that's why uh, the gap is not that there's not enough promotion. Uh, certainly for most destinations, in Europe, uh, the Chinese know them. And th as we said, they had a good time, enough time in the last one and a half year to learn more also about uh, smaller, less well-known destinations. Uh, so this is not the problem that then that they don't know about it. It's rather the problem that is there uh, something which gives them a reason to go there. So uh, therefore concentrating on quality on the satisfaction levels of both the visitors and also your staff, for instance. Uh, the uh, hope helping recommendations. And again, you can support this by saying, okay, uh, uh, we do a lucky draw and those people who uh, write the nicest sentence or have the nicest picture uh, about our destination, about our hotel, whatever, uh, where they can win a prize and thereby increasing uh, your yield. So you can ask for, for higher prices uh, for better services, or you can in, 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 uh, in improve your overall result because you can get Chinese visitors at low season times when otherwise uh, 
the hotels would stay empty and, uh, and nobody would visit uh, the museums and, and so on. So, uh, so you, and you, if you have some special activities, if you do a food festival or a football summer camp or for kids or whatever, they, they will stay longer uh, and spend more and give more recommendations to their peers. Because clearly when we talk about Chinese open tourists, we talk not about uh, so much about retention. So it's, it's most Chinese, even they like uh, the place, they will not come ne back next year because they still have a long bucket list of other places uh, to visit. They only started to travel recently. So they, they have also to go to many other places. So the question is not to tell them, okay, come back next year again, but to tell them, okay, please recommend us. And that today can be done even with live streaming. Please recommend us to your friends and your virtual friends, to your peers, so that they will come uh, and we will have uh, custom from them next year. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I will have to jump a bit so so we have still enough time for your for your questions. Uh, so we we can see we're just saying that China. Uh, has been uh, leapfrogging. Frogging. That means uh, you can see that uh, uh, when I was a tour operator bringing German tourists to China, that was end of 1980s, before 89, uh, there were almost no telephones uh, in, in, in China. So, uh, and, and so China jumped directly from no telephone to smartphones. Uh, and uh, they, they jumped uh, in many other ways uh, forward. And so the, the same is also, of course, now uh, with all this uh, online communication. So Chinese uh, spent on average six and a half hours per day on their mobile phones. And I saw even for senior citizens, this number is four and a half hours. So uh, which is way above the global, the global average. So social media yes, do play a key role in China. Certainly you do everything, uh, uh, shopping, banking, uh, looking for information, uh, but it is rather, it's not so much that they look for uh, advertisements of, of uh, some foreign companies. And if you look at the top internet applications, uh, you can uh, go through this bottom uh, and you will find Tourism is not there. Tourism is not among the top uh, internet applications uh, which are offered in the Chinese market. And uh, yeah, so the Chinese ecosystem is is huge. And we will have actually in October another session where uh, we will look much more into this. How can you use TikTok and how can you use Mafangbo and all that stuff uh, and 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 Jidao, uh, Jihu and so on. And Billy Billy, uh, the, the one of the rising stars, and Kwai Show, and all that. Uh, but this will be uh, another topic. So for now, let's say uh, clearly uh, finding out what are Chinese travelers saying about you in uh, the travel portals like Mafang Wo and 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 Qiongyo. So what are they already discussing? Very important. Be aware of that and try to influence it and try to, to start uh, discussions there and, and put uh, so reasons for why people should talk about your place there. This will be uh, much more important than catching up now, which is uh, if now it's rather Kwaisho or Billy Billy, which in the last two months became more popular. This is very fast developing and very hard to, to follow. So uh, use what we call warm square, word of mouse and word of computer mouse. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, use uh, user generated uh, content, uh, refrain from sending out your nice uh, glossy brochure stuff or, or videos uh, which are shot in perfect uh, actors in perfect uh, locations. Uh, so people have been working in the past years a lot with KOLs, key opinion leaders. But even this now in China, most people understand that these KOLs 
are paid for what they are saying. They are paid for saying this is a wonderful place. And now a lot of people have been moving uh, to work with KOCs, key opinion customers. So people who actually are customers and they will tell their 1,000 friends or 1,500 friends or whoever, how much ever that this is a great place here. This is a great hotel. This is a great uh, golf course. And this will be something which will be believed. And of course, it is reaching less people, but the friends of rich travelers are probably also rich people. So this will be exactly the, the target group uh, you're looking for. And this is information which people believe in. So uh, yeah, I think we, uh, we, uh, we will skip this. So all this will be in the recording. So you can have a look at this later on. Uh, and so let's come to, to a Q and A session because I'm sure there are, uh, people who want to, uh, know a lot about this. So I, I will stop for the moment, uh, the presentation and, uh, so uh, uh, perhaps I can help you. Please, um, well please done. do. Uh, there are some questions here. So if you agree, I will read them to you. Okay, please do so. Okay, great. For the others, uh, please remember you still uh, are on time to submit all those questions. Um, so, so please do not hesitate and anything that comes to your mind, this is the right time. Um, so the first one, it's actually something that has been in our heads, at least in mine and everybody that operates or, or has something to do with China in the past few weeks. And I remember talking about this with you. So um, I, I'm sure that you can elaborate on this. Um, somebody from the audience is asking, when do you think the tourism into and outside China will start again? This is the million dollar question indeed. So <laughs> yes, I, I, I've been briefly mentioning this. So uh, this is, everybody is discussing about this and you can hear all kinds of arguments and there have been some uh, I, I think the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, the EIC, they published something saying they think it will be the middle of 2022, the, so one year from now when, when China opens up. Uh, so this was a very pessimistic idea. Uh, so it, of course it is, well, we all have learned uh, we are living in, in, in uncertain times. Of course, it all depends on what happens with the Delta mutation and what have you. Uh, but so certainly uh, the Chinese government has uh, been very successful in telling their own people, look, thanks to President Xi and his uh, wisdom and the Communist Party, uh, so we have uh, defeated uh, the virus within a few months. And so, so the last person who died from COVID-19 in China died on the 31st of January. So for half a year, nobody has died in China uh, officially, and probably it's even true, uh, from, from COVID-19. So, uh, and if there has been some small outbreaks, there was a few weeks ago, there was a small outbreak in Guangzhou uh, and they, they blocked the whole city and they tested 80 million people within four days. They are vaccinating about 20 million people per day in China, uh, quite some feast. And so therefore, uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, China does not want to see big numbers of, of in, uh, in infections again, because that would destroy their story that their government, the Chinese government is better than the stupid Western governments uh, to, to, to fight the, the, the virus. But on the other hand, as I said, there are a lot of Chinese uh, who are also very eager to be allowed to travel again uh, for family reasons, for business reasons, but also, of course, for, for, for leisure travel. So uh, from all the people I've been talking to, so some people say if the Tokyo Olympics will happen without major problems, uh, and we see now the UEFA uh, Football Cup, which in, also is followed by many people in, in, in China, uh, we did have some infections, but we don't have the number of people dying going up. Uh, so if the Tokyo Olympics uh, will go like that, that there is not a big increase of people in hospitals, then uh, maybe October golden week will be the time when, when the borders 
uh, open again. And this is inbound and outbound, of course, for letting foreigners in, uh, which might be even later because while well, there's a, uh, there's not that much pressure. Uh, so international tourism into China is not so important for the Chinese tourism industry. They earn their money with domestic tourism and outbound, not so much with inbound. But so for letting Chinese people travel again, so October 1st, I think, is a realistic uh, option if no uh, Black Swan events happening. Uh, other than that, it, it, uh, so I, I heard from a couple of Chinese tour operators that they prepare uh, already big way for the Chinese New Year period, so that this will be the time that would be uh, January uh, next year. And then you have the Winter Olympics, so some more pessimistic people say the Chinese government wants to have the, uh, the Winter Olympics done in a perfect way without any uh, restrictions, and it would be only after the Winter Olympics. So, but clearly what, what people have been saying is that there is a lot of discussion going on behind the scenes and the, the people who are talking about social harmony in the society and the people that are talking about the economy are saying we have to open up again and the people who are talking about uh, stability and health measures, they say no, no, we should keep it closed. So this is something, uh, but so a lot of people I talk to, they all agree it will come probably at short notice. So it will be rather that they will say, okay, from next Monday, uh, this, this is possible. And it will come probably in stages. So there is a talk that maybe already from next week or in two weeks, uh, there will be a Hong Kong China bubble, maybe not opening the land border, but only allowing flights from the big cities in China into Hong Kong, which of course are much easier to control in number of travelers and also at the airport, it's easy to control people. Uh, and also it might so be that there's no answer to say on this date, all countries in the world are open for Chinese people again, but that the government will say, okay, there is a bubble so you can travel to, I don't know, Singapore, uh, but you're not allowed to travel anywhere else. And maybe if we are lucky the same for Europe, that is okay, you can uh, enter Schengen area again but you're not allowed to go to Great Britain if they still have uh, many uh, virus cases there. So, but I think that the point is, the, the key point is the time to prepare is now because once they, they, they start, so I'm, I'm using this uh, image of a, of a ketchup bottle. So you shake the bottle and nothing comes out. Uh, and then at one time, whoops, everything comes out at the same time. I think this is what we will see. So the time to prepare to, to do the product adaptation, to come together and say, okay, what market segments are the most interesting for us? And uh, of course, uh, with, with the help of people who know about this, so that is what, what we are doing, uh, of course. Uh, so, so that now use the time to prepare to say, okay, how do we want to have Chinese tourism, which has been developing by itself more or less, rather unplanned, uncontrolled, uh, that you have a, a, a better tourism using the time before the, the, the borders are, are open again, which I think, uh, yeah, I'm an optimistic person. I think October, we will see the first travels. And uh, it may also be, be that maybe in the beginning, it will only be business travelers uh, and not leisure travelers yet. So that is something, uh, but certainly the Chinese government is under a lot of pressure from, from the society. They, they have to open up again. This is part of the individual freedoms the Chinese uh, society has uh, traded for their uh, political influence. Laura. Thank you. More? Thank you very much. Welcome. Yes, yes. Uh, it was a very detailed answer. Uh, ah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. To... It is. It's perfect. Actually, I will just to remark for those who don't know about it. You mentioned that one of the considered um, dates to open is um, 
actually the, the October holidays. For those who don't know, actually in China, they take one week uh, vacation from the 1st of October to the 7th. And, and usually one week window is, is good enough for them or long enough for, for Chinese tourists to, to go abroad and to travel. So I'm sure that if the gates are open by then, uh, a lot of them will, will start to, to travel. But it is true, it makes sense that actually uh, we will see more um, business travelers uh, before than actually real tourists. Um, there is a question a little bit more specific from one of the participants. Um, this person is running uh, a business where they offer uh, uh, experiences. I, I think you have mentioned something along your, your presentation. These experiences are, are based mainly uh, focused on nature. So they are doing rafting, paddle, surf, kayaking, horse riding, canoeing. Uh, and this person is wondering whether these kind of activities are, are actually a fit for, for Chinese visitors. Yes, cert certainly. Uh, this is something. Uh, so you you will be one of the winners of the whole development because uh, you can see that uh, uh, maybe you have noticed I didn't mention shopping much in my presentation. Uh, so because this is has become much less important than it, than it was before. So and uh, so people rather spend their budget and, and say in service that what they plan to do in the future is that they spend less on shopping and more on activities. So therefore, uh, if you can can offer this kind of uh, kayaking and, and similar things, this will be interesting for the Chinese. Again, uh, you will have to uh, adapt the product in a way, for instance, that uh, you have to make sure that uh, there is documentation so that maybe uh, you, uh, if you show them for 90 minutes how to do that, because they have never been in a kayak before maybe, then they get a certificate that they are now uh, kayaking uh, in this and this region experts or something like that. And make sure that you have a, a video ready where you see uh, uh, t t 15 minutes of uh, generally the landscape and so that you can if your computer then you can cut in two minutes of these customers into the the the, uh, the overall uh, video and give them a, a USB stick or something with with the video where so they can show this to their friends so this kind of things which uh, probably uh, well, if I would be your customer I don't care about that I mean I want to have the experience for me uh, but uh, I, I, I don't need to show this to my friends in such detail. For Chinese people, it's always very important to, to show to others what they're doing, to report on, on, on WeChat and, uh, and, and, uh, so, and also to prove uh, what they're doing. So in China, uh, <laughs> embellishing the truth a bit, let's say like that, is much more common and it's not forbidden. Uh, you don't go to hell for that, like you would do in a Christian uh, culture setting. So therefore, if they tell their friends, oh, I've been kayaking all by myself, they will say, oh, I don't believe you, uh, show me proof. So, so this is stuff which uh, you have, so therefore you have to, to, to adapt the product and then certainly uh, you will, you will uh, be successful. And I will, in the next part, I will also show some examples for that. Great, and, and perhaps we can look uh, into the last question of this blog. Um, uh, Somebody is asking, uh, and you mentioned that now the, the profile of the visitors has changed. There is quite a lot of uh, young visitors that are much more informed and also uh, more elder, elder travelers. Uh, and you talked a lot about uh, the learning experience of the travelers. Does this also apply as, as the, the, the elder community or is this more into the, the younger one? No, this is uh, uh, this is very much for older people because you and there are some good examples where of of uh, some people using this already. So you have in many places in China you have something like uh, called senior citizens uh, academy or senior citizens university uh, because you have a lot of people when they were young. Either it was cultural revolution time, so the universities were closed, or they were too poor at that time to, to attend the university, but now they are retired and they, they got some money uh, and they are interested to do some educational stuff uh, for, for fun and, and to catch up 
that they feel they should be more educated and they didn't have time because they had to, they were working all very hard and successful. But uh, so if you have something to offer and that uh, can be uh, language courses or history or architecture or cooking or becoming an expert in, in wine tasting. Uh, so this is, this is very interesting. Again, of course, uh, so you will, you will have to do this in a way that it is not too serious because these people are not really doing this uh, for the career. They're already uh, at the end of, uh, of their career. But th so it's, it's, it's fun and it's not too much. But again, it is, it is done with something you can brag about so that maybe uh, you have, uh, if, if you have a Spanish language class uh, that, that for one time for 20 minutes, you have some famous uh, Spanish author coming and talking to these people so that they can take a photo uh, with this famous author or things like that. Or you could combine this, for instance, with uh, going to some places in your region which are featured in, in Spanish novels so that you can combine uh, reading about this place and 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 uh, seeing that the actual place where 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 it happens. So uh, I don't know. There, I re just one example. I remember there are some very nice uh, books about Barcelona. Uh, I've got the title something with a, the wing of the angel or something like that. So and and where I've been doing this, I've been going. I went to Barcelona and I with this book in my hand and I, I looked at all the places which are described in in in, in the book. So, so, so to make it a bit more interesting, a bit more fun, but this, yes. So this will be one of one of the of the future markets if you can, if you can organize this. And the important part here is that you have distribution channels for this. So I, I know some people they work with the Jiangsu Province Old People University, and this they have they have half a million uh, members. So maybe not all of them are rich enough to travel to Europe, but maybe 100,000 of these people are. And once you have established this contact, again, this is something we are, we are helping people to do. Uh, once you have established this contact and you have the first two groups and they are happy with your service, there are 100,000 people waiting in, in line to come one after the other. So that will be a conveyor belt uh, where people come more or less automatically. Uh, so, and so that this is a good example of, of the many opportunities you have when you stop thinking about a tourist is a guy, is a, a lady in a bikini on a beach, uh, or a, a guy in a bar drinking, uh, one margarita after the other. And you start thinking, uh, this is a, uh, la a Chinese lady in her fifties, uh, with a, strong appetite to to learn more and to educate herself to become a more full personality to have something interesting to talk to the to her friends at home thank you very much Wolfgang. i think um we have covered most of the questions that have been submitted so far okay yes and i as i said i will have some more practical examples so that might hopefully will also help so i will go back to uh, the presentation from where we are, and I will uh, wait a second. I have to share the screen again. Uh, that should be it. Oops. Uh, here we are. Okay. So, uh, so let's come to the to, to, to the last part, and uh, I, I will make sure that we have time for another Q and A round at the end. So what 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 to do? And so uh, clearly, people still want to travel, uh, also in China. So when it becomes possible, uh, they will come, and you can see some people say, okay, I will I will travel as soon as possible. Some people say, okay, I will wait for a few months to see if it's safe, but then I also will travel. So this is something which, which will happen. It will be more nature-based activities, more going to new places, to less crowded places, and do more meaningful activities, do something which goes beyond just taking a photo and, and, and uh, 
running into some uh, shopping malls. So, and we will have less package stores and more uh, self-organized uh, places. And so, yeah, as you see at the bottom, I said it's October Golden Week probably is what I think will be the, the outcome. So it's still about seeing the world with your own eyes. It's still about gaining prestige and status. It's still following your, your leisure, serious leisure interests. Uh, and for some people also following their, their idols or maybe the, the, the movies they saw. But what is, what's hap what is new is nature helps traveling with other family members, going to places where not so many other Chinese tourists, not so much going to the big cities anymore, but more to the smaller places and more interest in actually getting in contact with the local people uh, and and doing something which is authentic or at least looks like authentic, and also uh, certainly a much bigger interest also in green issues. So in in everything which is connected to sustainability. So that is why we have developed this concept of meaningful tourism. And so, uh, so we all know sustainable tourism. And so in ten years ago. Uh, this concept of responsible tourism was developed, but I think this is still looking at the situation today. Uh, this is all too narrow and it's not taking so much into account the, uh, the satisfaction both of the guests and of the hosts. So meaningful means for the tourists that they have uh, increased their, 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 their knowledge uh, for the hosts that they can also have a benefit from the visitors, you can talk to interesting people for the stuff that if you use the Chinese market right, you can open 12 months a year. Uh, and and I think this is some, the, the, the elephant in the room, which is uh, of, often taken for granted. There is seasonality, of course. Yeah, summer is high season, winter is low season. This is not God given. This can be changed if you have customers who are not coming for beach and sunshine and warm water to swim in, which is the Chinese, they're not coming for that. So, and also if the people are feeling more part of the community, they will uh, have less damage done. And, and we developed something called Advantage Tourism. This is a practical program. And we are happy that we have been doing some uh, with Tour España already, something in this direction. And of course, we will be happy to do more with uh, any of you interested in that. So this is a paradigm which is based on the, the physical base. Obviously, if, if you don't have uh, the Mount Everest, you can't offer uh, uh, mountain, uh, extreme mountain climbing. Uh, so, so you have to bring together what can be offered uh, and then to understand what is the source market looking for. Of course, on the right-hand side, you can see all this nowadays is supported by, by uh, AI and IT and digitalization. And then the step product adaptation. And from that step, you can develop trust that people feel welcome. And now with this Asia hate stuff, of course, many Chinese are, their main question is, are, are they uh, happy to receive Chinese tourists or uh, will they throw stones at us, at us or make angry faces saying you brought the virus or something like that? which uh, in America happens more than in Europe uh, and which has been widely uh, published in the Chinese press, of course. And from that coming to a, a level of embeddedness that they feel part of the place. And from that comes uh, a higher level of satisfaction. So, so that we, we, we try to, to avoid to go down to this downward spiral that you you, you go down with the price and go down with the quality, go down with the satisfaction, and that goes down. So uh, to go uh, to meaningful tourism where you can break this uh, chain and and go upwards uh, with uh, uh, your market and, and, and attract different people. So talking about Spain, so uh, we found and we well, I hope you don't shoot the messenger, but this is the the the, the result is that uh, everybody or almost everybody in Spain said yes, China is a very important market. But when they were asked, okay, 
how much do you know about the market or how much do you know about your customers? Simple questions. Uh, the, the majority of the Chinese people visiting your destination uh, from North China or from South China or from East China? The answer is, I don't know. The tour operator who brings them is in Shanghai, but I have no idea. So, uh, and, and uh, so really very little uh, idea about uh, what, is, what do they want or what do they do in a destination? And so if you look at the social media, the Chinese say what they found the most interesting to look at is very often very different from what the official uh, marketing is saying. This is our, our main thing you should look at. And, and so, and a very strong belief, I would say almost a religious belief in, in uh, uh, promotion. And, and so if you ask people, what are you doing for the Chinese market? The answer is, oh, we, we have, have a Weibo account or something like that. So that uh, not much has been done, I'm afraid, uh, to, to tell uh, for a place like Spain, uh, using this example, which is very diverse and you have a lot of different things. Uh, I've, I've been to many places in Spain. I think it's, it's a great country. Uh, but for the Chinese, it is Barcelona and Madrid. In a smaller way, of course, also Sevilla and Granada. But uh, if you look at the numbers, you can see it is, it's, it's mostly that. And also it is mostly for shopping. It's mostly about factory outlets, La Roca, La Rocha. Uh, it's, so there's no typical Spanish product existing. And even for food. So uh, uh, the Huron report has a list of the, the 15 most preferred food styles and uh, Spanish food is not there. So Peruvian food you can find, but not not Spanish food. Even so, local food is the number one for luxury tourists. What they do in each destination is tasting local food. So, and obviously Spanish food is not uh, quite famous. So there has been obviously not enough done to uh, promote this. Spain is used by the Chinese and you can see the image of, of the, what the Chinese have produced themselves is Spain as a fairy tale destination. And you see there have been some romantic TV dramas, a uh, lot of Chinese couples, they take photos uh, for, for their wedding. And uh, so the, the, the palace in Madrid is a very uh, often used background for the wedding photos. Or you see this is the Vogue China uh, uh, magazine. And you see this lady uh, po posing uh, with a, good looking uh, Torreo or so. One of the things you find often in Chinese social media that they say, one of the attractions of Spain are the good looking men. And, and this might be football players, it might be Toreros, so that this manly uh, image, like obviously the guy <laughs> on the cover is a, a example of. So this is what the Chinese have made up by themselves more or less, that Spain is a fairy tale place, which is not fitting with what Spain is t telling about itself. But if this is what they are looking for, maybe you should give it to them. Uh, oops, oh, sorry, I made a, uh, I, uh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. We are back here. Okay. So, uh, so, so what you clearly have to do is to know more about the market segment you want to take care of. Are you, are you rather people looking for sun seekers, people from Beijing or fun seekers, people from the South? This is of course generalization, but better than nothing. And maybe just looking at the bottom. So China, for example, is the fourth biggest Christian country in the world by number of believers. There are about 70 or 80 million uh, Christians and most of them are urban middle class people, so people who have money to travel. Uh, there is actually, you can see, uh, there is a, a, a guidebook uh, for uh, traveling on, on the Camino de Santiago. Uh, I have not found uh, any uh, marketing for uh, any promotion for the Chinese market. Of course, you're not allowed to talk about religion, you have to talk about uh, self-improvement or Christian culture or something like that. Uh, but so this is something which will be interesting for a lot of, or is interesting for a lot of people in China. Uh, but of course, 
that is not automatically coming to your mind that you think of China as a, a Christian country, though, that there are more Chinese Christians than there are Spanish Christians. Uh, so this is, yeah, where uh, we see our job to help with that. Horse riding for very rich people is one of the latest after golf and, and tennis. Now horses are uh, getting into fashion. Obviously, Spain has a lot to do. Uh, offer there football, football, football. Uh, I, I won't talk about the recent days, but uh, so this is something. And also, Chinese are very interested in power, so they are more interested maybe in the history of the Spanish Empire, which spanned half the world once, than uh, your average uh, British uh, uh, pub and beach uh, visitor. So, uh, for all this, you can uh, we talked about education, you can have. Oops, sorry, something is wrong. I'm so sorry. Uh, I hope you're not too dizzy. From <laughs> So that's the right way to do it. And I have an example also for, for shopping. Uh, we discussed this with uh, some, some friends in Sevilla. So, uh, and, and they said, well, a lot of Chinese people are interested to buy castanets because they are small, easy to transport, uh, don't break easily, but what you what you can buy in a souvenir shop is uh, normally is a, a castanets uh, made out of plastic and made in China for five euros. But there are a few uh, uh, artisans still making uh, handmade professional castanets. And again, if you package this right, so if you say this work, there's a workshop or part of the workshop is open for people to have a look and to see how it's done. And that maybe you have a photo opportunity with the the, the old guy who was doing this in three, since four generations to have a photo taken with this guy. You provide a written explanation of the history of both the, the Castanets and also the, 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 the company. And you give them a certification so they can prove this is not a fake, this is a real. You have a very nice packaging for this. And maybe you have a discount voucher for one of the flamenco shows or the, the, the nice uh, flamenco museum you have in, in Sevilla. Uh, and of course, you can give them a list. There are about 30 flamenco schools in China. So where if they want, now they have seen flamenco in Sevilla, they want to go and, and learn more about this, they can do this back in China. And this uh, professional castanets, I was told, cost something like 150 uh, euros or 200 euros, but they will you will have customers buying that and they will be very proud and they will show this to many of their friends and talk about this. If, if you just tell them, buy them and they cost 200 euros, they will not. But if you package it like it has been described here, they can do. Or another example, this is from my own personal experience. Uh, I've, I've been uh, uh, working with the, and I'm still working with the University of uh, Girona or Girona, uh, you can choose. Uh, so, and and uh, we had a little uh, workshop for the local tourism industry about the Chinese market uh, the university organized. And there was a, some guy, he said, yeah, he has a, a, a company and he's offering paragliding. So where you are uh, to go on a parachute as a, as a passenger. And it turned out that he had a lot of Chinese customers and we talked about this and it turned out the first were two Chinese students from the university. They, 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 they did this and they told their friends on the social media and then some other people, Chinese visitors to Barcelona, uh, they, they contacted uh, the company and they, they booked it, their paragliding experience. And it's very interesting because in China, you can't do that. In China, uh, this is all uh, the, the airspace is only for the military and, and maybe the police. So there's no such offer in China. So that's why it's very attractive. And of course, it's something spectacular. You can tell your friends about you. Uh, people are very impressed if you do that. And so after a while, some Barcelona-based Chinese inbound tour operator contacted him and said, okay, can we, buy, can we make a contract so we sell this to all our Chinese customers coming to Barcelona? Because with the high-speed train, it's, it's less than an hour to, to Girona and no problem. So, and also what I explained before uh, for, for the, the, the uh, kayaking. So they have a, a prefabricated video uh, and where, they, where you see some wonderful uh, 
uh, video of, of, of all this uh, parachuting, the, all the process, and they cut uh, the individual uh, scene with the the customer into it, and they give it uh, as a part of the of the thing. I think this costs something like eight hundred euros or seven hundred euros, so it's not cheap. But they said now they didn't do anything for it; it all happened by itself. But they they realized what the people want, and so like this idea with this video, and. Uh, and they said, yeah, they give them a certificate. Until now, it's only in Spanish. But they, when I talked to them, that was maybe three or four years ago, they were saying, yeah, now we will have also a multi-language version. So there will also be a Chinese version. And this is, they said now like a quarter of their customers are Chinese people. It works. And another example, uh, which is uh, from uh, Chinese uh, travel portal, I think that's from, from Marfang War, uh, we found the, uh, a story that people were talking about Toledo and they were talking about the grandpa roast pig. And that is a restaurant obviously uh, where you can order a whole uh, well, pig let, I would rather say, of course, not a <laughs> grown up pig. And that there will be a, a gentleman who they thought is a grandfather. Uh, they, they will, they, he will cut the pork for you on the plate. And so this is a, uh, quote from, from the Chinese social media, he will give a speech first, although we can't understand a single sentence, there's still a sense of ceremony. The pig skin is crispy and after cutting it, the plate will be broken to express a pleasant meal. A very unique event, highly recommended that you try it. So this is already something where uh, you have uh, people saying, oh, wow, this is something special. But also, of course, you, you can see probably there's more to it. So the, why are they breaking uh, the, the, the plate? There's probably a, a story behind this with it's more interesting and more detailed than just saying express a pleasant meal. Nobody told them. Uh, so, and of course, if you have uh, also make sure that you can have a photo with grandfather uh, so that that is, will be also very nice. And of course, if you can explain a bit more uh, why is this uh, restaurant having this special dish? Uh, and is I don't I, I'm I'm afraid I don't know. Is this a Toledo uh, a typical uh, tradition, or is this just in this one restaurant? I don't know. Uh, so, but that people can have more to talk about. And of course, <laughs> the usual topic for Spain that Chinese are uh, not used to start eating at 10 p.m. So that there were, uh, that was a complaint of these people also that uh, uh, why can't they op offer this also for lunch or some other time, uh, not so late in the evening. So, and that means also maybe you can have at lunch mostly this for Chinese tourists so that you can have your normal business uh, in, in the evening. So, which means also you can have more customers in a given day. But again, so you can see uh, yeah, they also mentioned that the, the, the skin is crispy, but it's not so much about how is the taste of the pig. It's so much. It's 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 about the 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 theater around it. The, 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 that this is something which is a uh, something spectacular, something special. So uh, the point is so as we said. Uh, for Spain, for example, and the, tr the same is true for many other places. Uh, and as Taleb Riffa has been saying, don't try to go back to where we were before. Don't try to go back to 2019. Uh, because that means going back to the situation where you, you get people visiting at the time when you need them the least uh, in places you need them the least. So which is summertime in Barcelona and Madrid. So, and we can use the opportunity uh, to offer more specific uh, products uh, to, to more specific target groups and thereby earn more money, have happier customers who are recommending you. So save all the money uh, you, you are spending on Chinese social media without ever knowing what is the result. Uh, are the Chinese coming because of that or would they come anyway? and concentrate that uh, for all uh, uh, stakeholders involved, satisfaction that they are happy what they get, happy what they do, happy how much they earn, uh, happy about their job. 
uh, that this is this is uh, the the key, and I think the Chinese market has the advantage that they do not have yet such fixed ideas of what to do, where, and when. If you try to sell a uh, Spanish language class in November in uh, the Pyrenees Mountains to Germans, that will be difficult because they know. That's not what you do. That's not the time of the year. That's not the place. For Chinese, they don't have such fixed ideas yet. Uh, 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 and of course, what we would have been better, you start from the beginning of this. But now, with this break of the pandemic, that gives the advantage to say, OK, let's develop like this examples I showed you. Let's develop this and, and consciously and not like the guy in, in uh, with the para, paragliding uh, the, the, the flying school that this happens by accident uh, because he was lucky that there were some Chinese students in the university, but that you do this really uh, uh, planned and, and on, on purpose. And then I, I'm sure uh, the Chinese market is very uh, important and can be a very important part of your business. And so I've been using examples for, from Spain, but of course this is true for, for all European destinations and uh, uh, so one, once you understand, okay, what what do this kind of people want? What can I offer to them? And then do something. So final words, uh, maybe you know uh, Mario Hardy, who until last month was the CEO of Pater, and he said uh, the future of tourism will depend more on length of stay and visitor satisfaction than on a generic and simple headcount of arrivals. Metrics that track such indicators will possibly, possibly become a new standard for determining tourism potential and performance in what is likely to continue being a volatile world. So you can see, you don't have to believe me, uh, Mario uh, is uh, saying basically the same thing. And uh, Petra Hedorfer, the boss of the German National Tourism Board, uh, wrote to me uh, in, a, in a LinkedIn message a few weeks ago, uh, in, in a comment to one of my posts. Yes, indeed, Wolfgang, tailor-made offers, specific targeting and reshaped offers for the new mindset, including community management are essential. So, and this lady has been the boss of the German National Tourism Board for the last 17 years. Uh, so who am I not to believe her? So this is all from me, but we still have time uh, for uh q and a uh, and so and by the way as you can see on the slide uh we are publishing also some free stuff uh which is uh, a, a publication called country weekly and we have just started uh, a new a series of podcasts called Koti talks so these are resources uh, available to you for free every week okay that's uh, up to here. So let's see what other questions and comments have come up in the meantime. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, if you allow me, I can help you to summarize a little bit of, of, of the things or, or the questions. Um, before that, actually, I took some notes uh, out of the of the of the speech and of the presentation that I really found extremely interesting. If you allow me just to, to give uh, a little bit of sum up of, of the learnings today, um, it is very important to, to understand the change in the profile of the travelers because it seems that we all have a very traditional mindset of uh, Chinese middle aged people coming to Madrid and to Barcelona or to Paris to do shopping and just taking pictures in front of the, the main uh, monuments for five minutes and just, just spending all their time in, in, the, in the stores buying Dior and, and Gucci bags. And it seems that this is no longer what is happening. Um, still, I think that perhaps this could be linked with uh, one of the first questions that the, the food experience, the, the eating experience is still very, very interesting for them and something they, they really pay, pay attention to. Uh, in terms of regions or, or how, how to work together, I believe that your suggestion to ask um, uh, participants or uh, organizations and regions to join forces to actually try to reach to the, um, to the consumers in China, it's really interesting. Uh, the more the merrier and, uh, and in this case, more powerful, definitely. 
And um, I would like uh, here to just rephrase something uh, you mentioned uh, that it's important that the worms are actually tasted for the fish, <laughs> not for us. So we have to keep in mind that even if our product seems to be the perfect fit, we have to really uh, put ourselves in the in the shoes on the foot of the of the Chinese consumers and try to understand if this is exactly what what they are looking for or what it, it fits them, right? And um, with this, I would like to ask you one first question uh, regarding the meals. You were actually suggesting something very interesting, which is actually expanding the, the, the meals time uh, to, <laughs> to actually let the business have in another um, uh, serving time for, for Chinese, right? Yeah, so this, of course, the this is, if you ask Chinese people about what is what is the, the, the negative aspects of traveling in Spain, the number one answer is these crazy Spanish people start eating at 10 p.m. or even later. So we are used to eat at 6 p.m. We are hungry at 6.30. We are very hungry. And so at, at 7, we are, we are uh, uh, falling uh, down because we, we have no food. So Okay. But of course, <laughs> you know, if, if, like in Barcelona, if there's a restaurant opening at, at 7 p.m., this would be a tourist trap. <laughs> this would not be a good restaurant. Uh, so uh, and, and of course, the point is not to say all people in Spain should, should change their habit, uh, uh, but to say, OK, you can see this as an opportunity that you can say, OK, we offer not trash uh, tourist uh, food, but we offer the same food we offer for for our normal, let's say, customers uh, after uh, 10 p.m. Uh, that that but we have uh, a, uh, a session uh, where we do this uh, and maybe even then, especially for the Chinese market, where maybe if depends on how how uh, big your place is, or what what you can uh, afford. If you have enough Chinese customers, you might even have somebody then who gives some little introduction uh, in Chinese about the traditions and the different dishes and what are, what's the stories behind that. So, which I know some examples of some uh, restaurants in other countries where they do this very successfully. And yeah, so they simply, you pay rent for, for your restaurant 24 hours a day, uh, but uh, so why only use it? Uh, for for a couple of hours when you can use it more and you have uh, the, the, the the tables which would be empty, you can fill with, with Chinese tourists. So, but being careful not to give them the impression that this is, uh, you give them not the same quality of food than you give to the, uh, the, the local uh, or maybe the other tourists, uh, but make sure that they see that this is the same level of quality. Otherwise they will, be, feel uh, cheated, or they will think maybe you don't like Chinese. And that's that's why why you do that. But so, storifying. I think for all the stuff you're doing, so uh, the, the the Chinese customers, they want to tell their friends about it, and so if you give them the 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 story, and especially if there's some some superlative that you can say this is uh, uh, the most famous one or uh, if I go to a restaurant, I don't care much if any famous Spanish film star has also been eating in this restaurant or not. Uh, but for Chinese people, all these kind of things that you can show of some photos and say, oh, this famous person has been here uh, or this, uh, this dish is mentioned in some ranking as one of the top 10 dishes in Spain. Uh, so all this will be something they can tell their friends about and they to show that they found the right place and they they know that uh, so that is that is something which is more important for them and so which will 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 give you an an, an advantage in in the market uh, and of course I think Spain is having a, a lot of food which is also easy for Chinese people to, to accept. Uh, paella, everybody in China knows paella. That's about the only dish they know. Be and this is rice uh, with seafood. Uh, if it's uh, uh, paella with, with, with uh, Valenciana, I think, uh, with seafood. Uh, so that that is uh, what every every Chinese person likes. So it's, it's uh, 
it's easier for Chinese people to eat the different uh, and tapas, of course. I mean, one one solution now, of course, for the hungry Chinese at 6 p.m. is that they that you tell them, okay, uh, have some tapas first, and then have the main dish, uh, main meal late, later on. But same for tapas. Uh, all these nice little things, they ha all have a story behind them. They have a name, and they have a, there's a reason why this tapa is typical for this region. If you tell this, they will be very happy about that. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. So in terms of timing, uh, would you say that for lunchtime, noon, it's uh, acceptable for them, whilst in the afternoon, perhaps uh, around 6, latest 7 p.m.? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it depends on uh, how much international experience uh, they, they already have. But in China, clearly, uh, uh, you have... Uh, you start the day rather early and you have lunch at 11.30 or at 12 uh, and you have lunch. <laughs> so uh, you don't skip it. And and dinner is normally at, at six o'clock and now among young modern people, it may be 7.30, uh, then they already feel very international. But certainly after by many Chinese restaurants in China, they close at nine o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so that is, uh, and of course they 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 know that in some in in, in Europe in most countries, uh, you start eat, maybe dinner is typically at at eight or eight thirty or something like that, but uh, so ten is is really late, <laughs> too late for 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 many of them. So uh, yeah, so and and yeah, so that is something if you if you can tell them that okay, you get the real Spanish food, but you get it at a Chinese time. Uh, so so if you show them and you tell them, we do this for you because we know you would like to eat a little bit earlier. Uh, so we do this as a special service for you, but don't worry, it is the same quality and, and the same uh, food. They will feel welcome. And this, I mean, this is a key point in all the surveys. Uh, what are the key the KPIs for the Chinese to choose a destination, the number one is always, do they like us? Do they like Chinese people over there? And now with all the China, Asia hate stuff uh, and the virus even more. So they are anxious that people will not like them either because some people criticizing the Chinese government for Xinjiang and Tibet and what have you, uh, or that they are they are criticized for that they they brought the the virus to the world. So this will be the number one message is to say, uh, we, you're welcome here, uh, we, 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 we like you. Uh, so this is before, what can you do there? How much does it cost? How convenient is, is it to, 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 to go there? Number one is uh, showing respect to the Chinese and showing uh, sympathy and friendship and welcome uh, to the Chinese. This is for them the top thing. And in all the comments, this is always a discussion. And this is what I said before. They can't know this from the official Spanish or regional websites because obviously you will not tell them we hate you. Uh, you will tell them you're most welcome here. But can you believe it or not? So maybe this is the people in the tourism industry say so, but the people on the street, uh, what about them? This you will find out by asking other Chinese people. Uh, this is a source of information. And so therefore, if you have, again, the first Chinese coming, or if you have Chinese people now living in Spain, you still have ten thousands, tens of thousands of students, for instance. So to encourage them, uh, if you are, I don't know, Toledo, uh, so to grab the, the Chinese students who are in, in Toledo now and ask them to put some stories about uh, my life as a Chinese in Toledo, uh, where they describe what they're doing and where they describe that the people in Toledo are very nice to them and nobody is, is throwing stones at them because they have a Asian face. This will be a very good marketing activity for the, for, for the time now. 
Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Another question is, uh, which is the most effective way to do destinations marketing in China? In your opinion, <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, I, I spent, I think, half of the presentation trying to answer that. And uh, it, of course, if, um, this is EU SME. So we are talking to small, medium-sized enterprises. So of course, it's a big question of how much money you have. Uh, and, and this is why, uh, the more the merrier, as you said, uh, don't try to do it by yourself. Uh, so don't try to say we are a company in the northwest of Spain where you can rent a kayak. Uh, this is too specific, so nobody will find you. And, and uh, so you will have to do, put this together with your province or re your region or with other uh, people offering the same in other other places. Uh, maybe in other countries, so not your direct competitors. So, uh, the the but clearly, so as I as I said, the best way to do marketing is let your customers speak for you. Recommendation marketing that other Chinese people say, trust me, uh, you uh, this is a, a good place. These people here are nice to us, and the the service is good. So as we had this example with this. Uh, 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 paragliding school, they didn't do any marketing ever in the in the Chinese market. All their customers came only from uh, mouse to mouse uh, propaganda from uh, the first two customers, feeling that they were treated very nicely and that uh, these were friendly people. And this was a very exciting thing uh, to do. So, and and this is something. Uh, yes. You should go to tourism fairs once once they open up again. Uh, but again, be selective. If you find, okay, uh, we want to target people who come not in the summer because we have enough customers there, then go to the south, to go to the Guangzhou International Tourism Fair uh, in, 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 in Guangzhou and, and uh, uh, look for the South China market. Uh, because these people will come, they 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 don't uh, care about sunshine. They will come in in the other other seasons of of the year. Or uh, so. Also, see what the Chinese are talking about themselves. Because we talked about the elder elder generation, and that, that there are more will be more silver haired travelers in the future. One of the things you can find in many discussions are is the question: Is Spain too hot for older people. And this is a kind of a common wisdom that for older people, Spain is too hot. The weather is, is too warm. Uh, but of course, this is only true for maybe two months of the year. Uh, so, and that would be, again, uh, uh, is an opportunity. If you know that, so, or if you ask somebody to tell you what are they saying, then you can use this in your marketing and say, guys, uh, you know what? In spring and in autumn and in the south, even in the winter time, uh, it is uh, the weather is still nice. So I remember sitting uh, in an outdoor cafe in Sevilla uh, on Christmas uh, time, and it was 18 degrees, very nice. Uh, so so sell this so that you can tell people from the north of. But then it's the north of China. Tell them, okay, you can come when the weather is very cold and and very bad weather in, in Beijing. Uh, come to the south of Spain, uh, and you will have uh, you're you're very likely to have some nice uh, warm days uh, still at the time, and certainly in spring, uh, spring and autumn. So use this opportunity if they think older people should not go in July and August. Say yeah, but we have something for you. You can do here in March and April and and, and May uh, when it is uh, much more. Uh, uh, suitable for for if you're afraid of, of heat uh, to come to that month. But that means you have to know your market. If you're not aware of this argument, uh, then your your marketing towards the older people will fail because they will say, yeah, it sounds interesting, but I heard it's too hot there, so I don't go. So you have to you have to counter this argument and use it to your advantage by saying, yeah, maybe you should not come in July and August because well, we are full up anyway. <laughs> so come come and please come in April. Uh, so this is this is all based on uh, 
tell people what they need to know and what they want to to know about not what you think they should know and what and don't assume that they know things uh because you think everybody knows that uh certainly not and the easiest way for this is last point to make just turn it around and think about how much do you know about china so if i tell you uh do you think it is better for old people to travel to jiangsu or to zhejiang uh <laughs> what will you answer i have no idea what is jiangsu and zhejiang i can't even pronounce it so what are you talking about uh even so both our provinces have like 100 million inhabitants and uh, the gdp of spain uh so so uh there are many things uh that the, they will not know un, un, unless you you do tell them uh so so that is uh, the key before you start marketing think about what you want to tell to whom and what they might have a, as a preconceived information in in, in their mind Thank you very much, Wolfgang. And um, perhaps we can answer a last question before we close the session. Um, mm -hmm. This relates to uh, international tourist fairs in China. Which ones do you recommend uh, companies to attend, or regions, or uh, clusters of, of yes. different activities? Yes. So okay. So there are uh, mainly uh, two uh, fairs who are saying that they are on a national level so one is uh itb china uh, which is in shanghai and which will be this year in november instead of may uh in a hybrid form so that for people who are in china they can be there physically and for the others there is a virtual stand uh, and the other is this cottm china open travel and tourism market uh, which normally is in, in beijing in april and they have also i think in september a virtual uh, version of that. So if you are a, uh, a big company or if you're a national tourism board, uh, normally they go to these big ones. Uh, but there are many and, and some more important than others, uh, regional fairs. So there is the, uh, I mentioned already the, the Guangzhou International Tourism Fair uh, in the, for the south of China, which is actually organized by Hanover fair uh, and there is the uh shanghai world tourism fair uh which is organized by a italian company for the shanghai city government uh, and there is a fair in uh, Chengdu in sichuan for for the west of china central china uh and and then there are maybe 15 20 smaller ones but so it uh, the best one is the one for uh, your kind of product so uh, Chengdu is is a rather uh, mountainous area so if you have nature uh, maybe hiking or or mountain climbing or stuff like that so maybe it's a good idea to go to the Chengdu fair because uh, there are not so many international exhibitors so you will be noticed there uh, if you have something for young urban nights so if you want to sell night clubbing in barcelona you will probably go best to the uh, shanghai fair uh, for, uh, 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 shanghai world tourism fair in in, in shanghai uh, if you have uh, if you're the, the kayaking company uh, so you probably uh, go to this outdoor orientated guys in the south so you go to Guangzhou International Tourism Fair so you can't afford probably to go to all of them because that is too expensive uh, so select the one which is where you have uh, the, the biggest uh, probability highest probability that you meet uh, those people who are uh, interested uh, at the same time besides for many things we have been discussing <clears throat> besides the, the tourism fairs it's also a good idea to contact uh, organizations where people are organized who are interested in in what you have to offer so if you are uh, it, uh, like if you're interested uh, your, your 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 offer is connected to art uh, so that you offer 
you can, uh, for instance, very, very nice product in other countries, they do this already. Uh, you, you offer that you can visit the uh, ateliers, uh, the workshops of young uh, Spanish or whatever painters, and you can talk to them about their, their, their art, what they're doing, and maybe you can buy uh, a painting for 5,000 euros and hoping that in 10 years, this guy will be famous and your, uh, the painting will be worth much more. Uh, so that you have this kind of, 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 of trip, uh, where, which is very prestigious, of course, if you are in China in, in, in this field. Uh, then uh, probably you go to Beijing, uh, to, to the BITE, Beijing International Travel Exhibition, uh, because this kind of people, many of them will be working in the national ministries or uh, national art organizations. So, uh, and also not only to go to the fair, but also try to contact some, uh, for instance, universities uh, of, of, of modern arts, uh, where you can uh, do this for, for, the, for the people who are uh, professional uh, painters or students learning to become a professional painter. So that is the other, beside the fairs, I think this is for, the, for all this new uh, special interest is also to go directly uh, to, to these organizations. And uh, so, yeah, so we have been doing this several times already. And that is, of course, uh, something uh, you better have some professional help in that. Uh, but then once you have a services, so don't be afraid of niche markets because in China, a niche is still lots and lots of people. So I, I told you that there are 30 flamenco schools in China. Of course, 99 maybe 95% of the Chinese don't know what is flamenco and 99% of the Chinese don't care about flamenco, but 1% is still 50 million people. And these people are more likely to be affluent enough to travel internationally if they have this kind of refined taste. And you, you just, uh, it's very easy to find the 30 flamenco schools. Uh, so you, you, you just go to the Spanish uh, Culture Institute uh, in, in Beijing and they give you the list and then you contact them and say, okay, if you're interested in flamenco, uh, if you're a flamenco teacher, if you convince 15 of your students, you get a free trip to Spain uh, and they will, they will uh, do the marketing for you. Uh, so all this stuff is, you just have to do it. <laughs> so it just, and as, as Laura, as you said, yeah, you have to get rid of this idea that all Chinese are uh, coming in a bus and, and all they do is shopping. Uh, these people still exist and these groups will still be existing, but uh, less and less so. And also this is not the market uh, segment where you earn your money. This is a market segment where you have, uh, uh, you may be pushing away your traditional customers, uh, but not earning much uh, money in the process. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Uh, I think we run out of time. For those who submitted a couple of questions in the last minute, I will coordinate with Wolfgang and we will send it to you separately so that uh, we, we don't waste anybody's time. Uh, just before we close the session, I would like to thank again, obviously Wolfgang, you've been uh, fantastic as usual, but also our collaborators today, Empresa Pública para la Gestión del Turismo y el Deporte Andalucía, IPEX, Instituto de Promoción Exterior de Castilla-La Mancha, and to España, who have been uh, really supportive and made this uh, today's session possible. Again, please take a few minutes now when we close the session to reply to our um, survey because it really helped us to, to really uh, design uh, new content for, for your interest. And I wish you a great summer and uh, stay tuned to our website and our uh, social media to see what's coming up. Thank you very much. Okay. Also from me, uh, thank you very much to, to you, uh, Laura, and to all the people in the background who have helped to make this uh, moving on without any glitch. And of course, thank you also uh, to all the participants. And uh, uh, yes, I, 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 I promise that I will answer all the questions. And if you still have additional questions, of course, uh, you, can, you can contact me or you can contact the uh, EU uh, SME Center. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy uh, if you need any additional information and help to be of your service. Thank you very much.